Now the last part of the small intestine is the ileum and this goes into the first part of the large intestine which is the cecum. So this would be the ileum here the ileum and there's actually a valve like structure between the ilium and the cecum. So this is the cecum here, this first bit. The cecum is this first pouch of the small intestine. It's about six centimetres across. And this valve here would be the ileocecal valve. And the idea here is that material is able to get from the ilium into the cecum, but once it's in the cecum, it won't go back to the ilium. It's a valve. So chime will go through here. It's still called chime at this stage. Now the material which is going through here is largely digested. Most of the useful components have already been absorbed through the small intestine. But we're not quite finished with it yet. And quite a lot of water actually goes through here. About, about a litre and a half of water a day is going in here. And we don't want to lose that. Now it's important to remember which way round we are. So this is the right here. This is the right side. And the left is over here. So <clears throat> material going in to the cecum on the right. And then this goes up the way in a series of folds like this. So the colon is arranged in these <coughs> series of folds. And these are called haustra, these folds. One will be a haustrum. Now, what actually happens here is that one of these will contract and while that one is contracting, that one will relax. So the material is moved along. And then that one will contract. And the next one will relax. So the material is moved along. And this helps to mix it as well. This is called haustral churning. As it's churned up. So these will be the uh, haustra. These folds are actually caused by um, differential distribution of the muscle. So there's more muscle there giving rise to a bit of a, a nip or a tuck. Now as this goes up the way, if it carried on up here, being on the right side it would bump into the liver and we don't want that. So it makes a turn here. Makes a turn and then it goes along going from the right towards the, towards the left. Along there like that. Now, this bit going up is the ascending colon. And this bit going along is the transverse. So the transverse colon is going from right to left. And this is the position of the liver here. So this bend here is called the hepatic flexure. A flexure is a bend. So that's the bend by the liver. And then we go along this way, this same process of <coughs> haustral churning with some peristaltic contraction of the muscle to squeeze all the, the material along. And then when we get up to here, we're going to come across another organ, another organ about here. And that organ there is the spleen. So it's necessary to bend again. And this time it will bend and start to go down the way. again in the series of Haustra. So it starts to go down. 
So we've got the bend by the liver, the hepatic flexure. This is the bend by the spleen, splenic flexure. And then as it goes down, this is the descending. The descending colon. And it goes down to round about the level of the top of your uh, hip bone, you're really at crest. And when it gets to that level, I think you can see to go from the left side, we've got to go towards the midline now when we've got to go back to get to the rectum. So there's another stretch of colon there. <clears throat> and that stretch taking it back the way is the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon. And then the last part is a, a widened out part. That actually um, takes a bit of a turn there and there's a widened out part just there. A last widened out part. Then there's two rings of muscle. There's a ring of muscle there. And there's a short canal and another ring of muscle. These rings of muscle go all the way around. They're sphincters. So we've got the descending colon, sigmoid colon. This large part here, this fairly large part, it's about 20 centimetres in length. This is the rectum. And then the last part is the anal canal. With the anal sphincters. Now the internal anal sphincter is um, involuntary muscle. It's autonomic muscle. It works automatically. And the final sphincter <coughs> is voluntary muscle. We control that. So we've got this process going on. We've got lots of liquid chime going in here. Now lining the colon we've got columnar cells like this lining it with a nucleus and these have lots of villi, several hundred villi per cell giving it a large surface area. So if you imagine that all of this is lined with these cells, these columnar epithelial cells with their villi, you can see it's got a very large surface area. And that's very important so that water, some vitamins and ions can be absorbed. Sodium, potassium, various ions are absorbed through the mucosa. So as the material goes along, it's fairly liquid in here. And as it goes along, it becomes more and more sludgy. And then as more and more water is absorbed out, we get the semi-solid faeces that we are familiar with. So we've got the mucosa lining the colon. Then we've got the muscular layer. Well, no, we've got a submucosa. So it's a mucosa, submucosa, muscular layer. And then the outer layer, the serosa. So materials being absorbed all the time, ions, water, vitamins being absorbed. And the first half of the colon, sort of from there down, down the way, that's all controlled by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, one of the body's large parasympathetic nerves. because most gastrointestinal function is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. But the second half of the colon is controlled by sacral parasympathetic nerves that leave the spinal cord. So there's a sacral parasympathetic nerves controlling the second half from the sacrum. Now, in the colon, there's hundreds of different species of bacteria 
maybe six, seven, eight hundred or more species of bacteria. And this is why it's important that we take our uh, prebiotics because the prebiotics are nutrients that will help nourish the bacteria, making the friendly bacteria proliferate. <coughs> and sometimes, for example, after we've taken antibiotics, we might want to take probiotics like live yogurt to help recolonize the recolonize the colon. So this balance of bacteria is very important. And the bacteria will help to um they're the final breakdown agents really. They'll break down any residual carbohydrates or amino acids. As they do so, they give rise to a certain amount of gas, giving rise to uh, to flatus that will pass down the colon and pass out through the anal canal. This is, of course, completely normal, quite essential. <clears throat> so most people are probably passing about a litre or even two litres of flatus a day due to fermentation. The brown colour of the stool comes from the um, the breakdown of the bilirubin, the breakdown product of the the red cells. Now it's very important that we get good peristaltic action in the colon because if not we're at risk of constipation. So it's very important that we get plenty of fibre in the diet to add to the bulk of the faeces. So here for example I have some um, faeces for a person on a low fibre diet and we can see that the colon has got a long way to go to be able to squeeze down onto this material. It's got a long way to go because there's not a lot of material left. There's not a lot of residual material. So this patient needs advice on improving the amount of fibre in their diet. But when we give fibre, we have to give plenty of fluids as well because we don't want the fibre to dry out. If it dries out, it's even worse. So when we're giving advice, we always say fibre and fluids. The two go together. And exercise will help increase the motility of the colon as well. But by contrast, if we have a patient who's on a high fibre diet, we now have a large bulk of material. And you can see now it's very easy. It's very easy for the colon to be able to squeeze down onto that material. It doesn't have to work very hard to be able to pass this material along along the transverse splenic flexure descending sigmoid into the rectum. So we want plenty of fibre in the diet from fruit and vegetables. So we need this patient to eat lots of uh, vegetables and uh, plenty of fruit because these things contain residual fibre. Fibre is anything which will not be, um, not be broken down by digestive processes. It won't look like this in the colon, of course, but the fibre will be left. And another good source of uh, fibre is uh, oats. So again, giving plenty of material for the colon to press down on making peristalsis and transit through the colon a fairly rapid process. So in, in young fit people, we would expect the transit times from mouth to all the way through to be 24 hours or less. If you want to measure your own transit time, it's quite easy. You just eat some sweet corn and you can see it. So the uh, the fruits and the vegetables and the, uh, the oats are water soluble fiber. But it's also good to have some non water soluble fiber. Things that are brown like bran. That adds lots of bulk as well. So again, the colon's got plenty of material to press down on, which is good. We get good peristalsis <coughs> and we can avoid constipation with these combinations of fiber. But I think you can see that this fiber is very dry. So we'd have to make sure that this patient drinks plenty because we don't want um, the fiber to dry out. That might actually contribute to constipation. And plenty of exercise will help increase the the motility as well. So this churning is going on all the time. But then what happens is when you eat, eating stimulates a reflex called the gastrocolonic reflex. And that will cause the last half of the 
large intestine to contract very vigorously, pushing all this material down into the, uh, the rectum all of a sudden. So this material will get pushed down. Anything that's not really absorbed will get pushed down to the rectum. That will cause the rectum to dilate and that will trigger off the defecation reflex. So this is called mass movement or mass transitive material. <clears throat> and it's normally stimulated by uh, eating and drinking. Very often at the start of the day when you have a breakfast or a cup of tea in the morning, that stimulates this process off. Now the rectum is normally empty. So it only fills up with this mass movement, filling the rectum up, promoting the desire to empty the bowel, to defecate. And in English, the, uh, the faecal material which is expelled from the rectum, we often call stools. Now this actually comes from Old English in the 14 and 1500s, if you went round to see your friend and they were um, indisposed, um, that would be, they may well be at stool, <coughs> because a stool means a seat for one person. And uh, it was a place of, uh, of defecation. Privy was another old English word. But by about 1600, um, the term stool had changed from being the stool that you sit on to defecate from. It had changed its meaning to become the actual product, the stool itself. So um, for hundreds of years in England now, we've called the, uh, the faecal material stools. So plenty of fiber, plenty of exercise, plenty of fluid. The physiology of the colon is already quite wonderful, but we can make it even better by fibre, fluids and, and plenty of exercise.